Good morning and welcome back to the Artifact Scene podcast in this month's episode. Getting married. Why is it so difficult? Pronunciation of loan words. A very long and somewhat incoherent, on my part, ramble about technological advancement throughout history. And then we wrap it all up by reviewing The Stone Sky, the third book of the Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemsen. Bill, can I start the show uh, with some complaining? I'll allow it. Um, so everyone loves a good, good, good Irish whinge. You know, it's like a national pastime, and I feel like we should start a show like this if if if, <laughs> if it's applicable. Um, getting married, right? Remember, I talked last time about having woes about getting married. Man, I tr- I tried to talk you out of it, but you wouldn't listen to me. Well, the world is talking me out of it right now, which is not great. Um, oh I have updates, further infuriating updates that I want. I just want to vent and I just need a bit of catharsis, if that's okay. Yeah. So, the I was, I've was i been in contact with the embassy in, in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia. Sorry, for anyone who missed this, right? I was born in Saudi Arabia. This is problematic because in Ireland, in order to get married, you have to present an original copy of your birth cert. Uh, I do not have, to the best of my knowledge, an original copy of my birth cert, only a photocopy. So I've been trying to locate said original copy of my birth cert. And uh, therefore, I've been in contact with the Irish embassy in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh. Um, So the Irish embassy have been like, like really slow to respond. And probably because, you know, this isn't like major stakes here. They probably have like more pressing work to do. But still like, you know, it'd be like, a week or two between emails and you're like jesus come on that's like it's not that hard to just be like yes or no um and their final email they sent me they were like uh yeah so we can't help you at all um because of reasons i don't actually understand they were like it was manually issued so therefore we can't do anything and their advice was that i should um go to saudi arabia myself uh fly to the town that i was born in and try and engage with the local bureaucracy to get this birth cert, um, which is prohibitively expensive, right? An utter waste of my time, and also requires me to have legal powers that I don't currently have for various reasons I don't want to get into. So it like it just like legally does not work whatsoever. And they also require me to have like various documents that I don't even know what they are. Like they mentioned, go come with your father's ikama, I Q A M A. I don't even know what that thing is. Um, So that's just not an option. So as it currently stands, I don't think I can get married in this country. Period. Full stop. Um, So we are like genuinely entertaining the idea of eloping to some other country (laughs) that doesn't have like kind of this weirdly specific uh, rules around uh, getting married, getting married there and then just coming back and having a celebration here. Luckily, the UK appears to be one of those countries. Um, they just go, passports will do in terms of identification. I have a passport. This is no problem. Um, so it looks like we might be getting married abroad, <laughs> which is really weird. Just do it in Germany. I, we, I don't know the legality. Oh, no, wait, no. Uh, the captain did talk about this. Uh, I think she looked up what the rules were in e- in the EU. And for the most part, the EU seems to be relatively similar to Ireland. Um, and then Britain is a little bit different. Um, I think that's what she said, but th- please don't quote me on that. Um, the, uh, the States is also an option. Uh, but again, that's prohibitively expensive to, expensive to fly to the States just, you know, for like a, a half an hour ceremony and then to like, fly back home. I mean, yeah, especially when you can, you know, drive a couple of hours and do it and drive home. Drive to the UK? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we were thinking about actually literally flying to the UK because you would need to, if you're, uh, again, the captain knows more about this than I do, so I could be getting the details wrong here. But I think you need someone to like, uh, if, if you're not resident in the UK, but wish to get married in the UK, you need someone like a contact from the UK to like come and vouch for you. So like I have a, a bunch of family that, that are living in the UK and they and they also, they live right next to uh, one of the airports in London, which is great. So we could literally just fly into that airport in London, um, meet up with them, and then drive directly to whatever the registry office in their town or whatever, get a chance to say hi to the, to the family, get married, uh, have a quick meal with them, and fly back home. Um, and the cost of a flight to the UK isn't horrendous. And in fact, with the with the way um, 
gas prices or petrol prices are at the moment, it probably may actually be equally expensive to fly to the UK versus driving up to the North of Ireland. Um, so that looks like it's the plan, which, you know, never in a month of Sundays would I have been like, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm not allowed to get married in this country. Like, what, what is that? Like, it's so weird. It's so weird. <laughs> it's so weird. It's just, uh... <laughs> And my, my 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 greater concern, and I don't understand the ramifications of this, because again, this process has highlighted that if you deviate from the norm, there are problems. And I deviate from the norm in that, like you know, I'm um, come from like a bi-nationality family, if that's the correct way of phrasing it, um, uh, and I wasn't born in the country, so therefore, mm. and you were born in a third country, neither of those nationalities. Correct, right? So the more you deviate from, you know, you have, you have two Irish parents and you're born in Ireland. The more you deviate from that, the more problems you have going forward. And I wonder um, whether or not us uh, having to elope somewhere is going to generate further problems down the line, uh, either for us or for like potential spawn in the future. Um, you know, will 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 a will a baby Edgar come along and be all like, "Oh, I need to do this bureaucratic thing," and they're like, "Great, show us proof of your parents being born in this country," and you're like, "Or being married in this country," and you're like, "Oh God!" Uh, so that that that's Un- unfortunately, your father was married in Transnistria, so there's just there's just no way to untangle that. <laughs> yeah, ex- I mean, it sounds absurd, but like my experience is that that's entirely accurate. Um, so I wonder about like, are are we doing lasting sort of like damage and awkwardness by by doing this sort of crack the other option and i promise i'll stop talking about it now in a sec is that we could just rely on like the irish bureaucratic system being inept which largely it is uh so we could just show up with a photocopy of my birth cert which is in arabic uh and like you know made in the 80s and hope that someone goes eh, that, that must be what an original birth cert looked like uh, back in the day and they just accept the photocopy and don't ask any questions um the issue with that problem is that it would also need to be stamped by the Saudi embassy here in Ireland so I'd have to hope that the Saudi embassy don't care that I'm not handing them in an original copy which is not beyond the realms of possibility but it's a bit of a stretch and then I'd have to hope that the registry office doesn't care that this is a stamped photocopy as opposed to a stamped original. So there's two layers, there's two kind of blockades there for us if we wanted to just, like, try and wing it with the system. <laughs> yeah. It's just nuts, like... <laughs> so you're now you're now on record uh, stated an intent to commit marriage fraud. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I'm not even going to walk that back because, like, I am... I, 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 in good conscience, <laughs> I, can't, I can't engage with this system uh what you called in the way it wants me to because it's absurd the system is absurd i have no i've no intention of engaging with it the way it is it's just such a daft system so there you go so that's that's where that's where we're at well i, I had another uh response to that what, what, what was it um what was it what what was it the marriage fraud no nah, it's gone out of my head it'll come back to me at the end of the episode and i'll yell at you then <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, so that's that. Uh, pre-show done, let's do the show. Sebastian Ramu uh, emails us and has sent in a picture of an Urzelk in the wild. I have very little to comment on this other than <laughs> this is really fun and it's going to be chapter art. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so this is going to be chapter art. If you've got anyone who's out on a run, stop running, look at your phone, uh, open up your podcast player, there's a picture of an Urzelk. Bill, do you want to remind people what an Urzelk is? Um, so an Urselk is from the Icairn setting, mm. and it's a, a type of creature that lives in the Hoitan region, the island of Hoitan, and it's it's kind of a a, a, a mighty beast for hunting. Um, and it essentially looks well. I mean, anyone who's looking at the at the at the chapter art is getting a pretty good idea of what I had in mind. It's a bear with antlers. This picture, right? I take it that this is a Photoshop, correct? Or is this just a really thick deer? I think Photoshop. I think Photoshop. The lighting on the on the antlers, I don't think matches the scene. Mm-hmm. I think it's Photoshop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, no. What I'm saying that like uh, Seb uh, Sebastian Ramu went out and took a flight to Ikern, and he took a picture and came back to us. Um, now the 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 head would be more bear like in 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 my in my mind. 
it'd be a, a more like a bear head with antlers rather than a deer head on a bear body. Mm. Um, mm. But you know, I mean, it's 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 not half bad. It's not half bad at all. So there, Orzek, Orzek in the wild. Thank you, Sebastian Ramu. Um, next email we got was from Nick Schneider. Um who asks about the naturalization of pronunciation we talked... Was it the last show? Was Dune the last show we did? Surely not. No. No, we didn't do Dune the last show. No, we did Dune two shows ago. So this is from two shows ago. We talked about the uh, about the word jihad and... We talked about jihad uh, in the last show. Oh, was it the last show? Oh, there you yeah. go. There you go. So we talked about jihad and like uh, its usage, uh, its native usage and its usage in the English language and it being borrowed in and all that sort of crack. Um... So Nick Schneider writes, I'll just, it's, it's a little bit lengthy, but I'll just read out the whole thing. Uh, it won't take too long. Um, on the show recently, you and Bill brought up the idea of naturalizing foreign words into a language's phonology. This sparked my interest because an online friend and I were debating this. Bill and my friend brought up the, the point of a foreign word should not be naturalized if the target language has all the sounds of the borrowed language. I have a few questions about this. About what foreign words that break the target language's phonotactics. If we look at Slavic place names, there are many such towns and regions that have sounds that exist in English, or some equivalent, but clusters in locations that English does not permit, such as, uh, I'm going to struggle with this, Pniewe in Polish. It would be approx- approximated as Pniewi in English. However, English does not have any word starting with Pn, uh, of course, phonologically, not orthographically. What would the course of action be there? Bill, any thoughts? Um, I can't remember what it is exactly that I said that they're responding to here. Um, should not be naturalized. What 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 was I saying about naturalizing? So uh, I mentioned that. Um, so remember the commenter um, who uh, took issue with with the um, pronunciation and usage of jihad uh, was saying yeah. that like uh, us English speakers we mispronounce it. Yeah. And I go, yeah, but that's totally fine because, like, you know, uh, the German word zeitgeist is zeitgeist in English. We just, we don't... Oh, so naturalization as in changing... Yeah, yeah. Borrowing, it, borrowing it in and then, like, making it fit with, with the phonotactics. Yeah. And you were saying the word jihad, all those sounds are in English phonotactics. Are in, uh, sorry, English uh, phonology. Yeah. So we should pronounce it correctly. Correct. Or we should, we should pronounce it according to our, our, um, Arabic pronunciation. Yeah. Uh, okay. We, uh, so uh, now that you have that context, thoughts on that first section? Um, so if you, like, s- rules or words that break the rules of the target language is fun of tactics, just get over it. Jesus Christ, it's not that hard to pronounce PN. <laughs> it's, it's easy. See... Just, I think right, my, my or like 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 English speakers who can't pronounce preferred in 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 German or something. Just it's just a P and an F. Get over yourself. <laughs> so I think I think one should be dis- descriptivist, not per- prescriptivist in in general, but here so as well. I think there's always going to be weirdness when uh, languages borrow words from other languages, yeah. and like whatever weirdness happens, happens. And that's cool. And we should just, like, seek to describe said weirdnesses as opposed to being like, no, that is incorrect. You cannot do that. Um, so, like, if an English speaker pronounced fared as fared, that's fine. That's the English version of that word. That's cool. Like, there's a difference... They should get over themselves, though. No, no, but hold on. But there's a difference then if, like, the English speaker goes to a German speaker and says, no, you see, what you're saying is actually wrong. Like, it actually should be fared and the way you pronounce it fared is a load of nonsense like then obviously you know you're making judgment calls on how people speak and then you shouldn't do that but like words are just words and they'll travel around the place and people will use them Mm. differently and like that's cool that's fine like say zeitgeist say fared it doesn't matter and germans say zeitgeist and fared and and that's cool that is totally fine i'm sure we we butcher an awful lot of the greek and latin that we've borrowed into english but no one comments about it or no one really cares because hmm. it's just that's just that's just the nature of of words moving around like it it will happen and there will be mutations as it, as it occurs yeah i mean i i would i would agree with all of that in a kind of a in an even playing field situation yeah where, i mean that, where it's not a language that that is in danger or it's not a language from a culture that is um less powerful globally or like in, in under kind of hegemony of another culture 
uh, yeah, see, I say all of that. And then the minute that, that rears its ugly head, you're like, oh, that caused me to rethink things. Because a good example uh, that I'm familiar with, I'm sure you're familiar with too, Bill, is that uh, Irish is being like eroded something serious by the mm-hmm. influence of English. So like lots, of, for those who don't know, um, uh, the sort of native Irish phonological inventory is like quite complex with like a lot of distinctions that English uh, just doesn't care for. Uh, namely, um, all of the, con- I think all, uh, all or most of the consonants uh, have a labialized and a velarized form. So you have like a p, like a p and a w together, and then you also have like a p and a a, a voiced uh, velar fricative as a secondary articulation. I can't make that sound. Um, and those, but they have all the consonants have those variations. But of course, these only really exist in English, uh, or English doesn't really care about them that much. And so, a lot of people who are not native Irish speakers who learn Irish through like an English th- our English school system are we're losing that distinction in the language. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you ask anyone to just speak like a few words in Irish, they will just not pronounce it quote unquote correctly. And like in that case, I'm like, yeah, that's kind of really sad that like, you know, the influence of another language is completely changing this language and that language is losing um, losing what it was or whatever. Mm. Uh, so I guess like it's not, I guess with everything, it's not a black and white sort of thing, do you know? Um, in general, I err on the side of like what happens happens, and let's just try and des- describe that w- w- that was which is happening. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to trying to assign value judgments and be like, this is right, this is wrong, because like ultimately, like there is no right and wrong. So, um, but I take I definitely take your point with the influence of like uh, hegemonic cultures and all that sort of crack. Um, yeah. Yep. We also got another email, or was it an email? No, this wasn't an email. This is something I thought of, or I, I bring to the table. Uh, last uh, week, or last, not last week, last month. Uh, I haven't done that in ages. You've you, you've caught the, the bug from me. You've infected me. It's ridiculous. Um, we talked about um, filler words in German, or I talked about filler words in German, and how uh, I hate that I can't weaponize these things e- efficiently uh, in order to sound like a native speaker. I use the word filler uh, filler words, uh, but I'll link in the show notes to a video uh, from Easy German. It's a really good video. Go check it out, uh, where they talk about these things. These are called Füllworte. So basically the German for, for <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. Uh, words. But these these encompass two kind of sets, according to this video. You have modal particle, which are like modal particles. And they are easier to understand because, like, you know, we have modals in, in English and that's I can wrap my head around this, but the ones that are harder to understand for me are the so-called flickwörter or uh, AKA heckenwörter, and these are words that uh, they just they get put in two sentences, and they can subtly alter the meaning of a sentence uh, to like indicate intent or confidence and things like that, or they could be used to just fill uh, space. Like if a, if a speaker is like struggling to say a, a sentence, they can just be like, you know, uh, ich bin also ja uh, gegangen zu dem sozusagen, and they just put these words like also ja and sozusagen. They just pepper them in a sentence to kind of fill space. Um, and is sozusagen so to say? Yeah, it's it's kind of cognate <laughs> with so so to say. Um, that is, you know, the way people go like, that is how you say, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that sort of thing. You know, it's like, it yeah. means nothing really. It just fills up space. Um, so there's this, yeah, there's this weird thing where it, like, it fills up space. These are meaningless words that fill up space, but they also can be functioned to, uh, to be used to show um, confidence uh, or like how confident one is in, uh, in the um, statement. Um, like you might say like a uh, uh, bill, uh, ist ein Arzt. So Bill is a doctor. Um, but you could also say like Bill is um, quasi ein Arzt. Like Bill is sort of a doctor, kind of with the way uh, you would say it. Or like Bill ist sozusagen ein Arzt. And all of those like words, uh, quasi sozusagen, kind of subtly change the meaning of the statement. Like I declare that Bill is a doctor. Like, uh, you know, Bill is a doctor. 
built a doctor. It it just it's a whole thing, and I can't wrap my head around. They're really difficult to use, and I'll never sound like a native speaker until I can weaponize them fully. So there you go. Uh, all- so th- there's kind of a way to um, indicate your level of confidence in the truth of a statement in German. Uh, yeah, yeah. So what you're telling me is German is related to Pradaha. I, I mean, sure. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to say that, Bill, that's fine. <laughs> the hottest linguistic takes only on the Artifaxian podcast. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so that was that. Yeah, so, sorry, just it, to summarize all that again, I was using the word f- uh, f- um, filler words uh, when really I should have been using the word flickwörter or heckenwörter. Uh, links in the show. Heckenwörter. Heckenwörter, yeah. I think I think it's like hedge, hedge words. That's something to do with hedge or edge. Hecken. Um, anyhow, links in the show notes to that video. Go check it out. Um, it's in German, but it's got subtitles and it's really easy to follow. So you can have a look. Um, next a comment we got from Reddit. This is uh, from Olive Ubeen. Uh, and this was about... Um, underused we talked about underused periods in fantasy fiction on the last show um Mm -hmm. and uh one of the things that they point out and others pointed out is that i said that like oh you know the the library at alexandria burnt down and we lost all this like information and like that set us back etc and lots of people pointed out that like a this is not true and b it's even if it were true it's kind of a bit of an oversimplified uh take on how history works um so uh, apparently it's not true in the sense that li- the Library of Alexandria wasn't crammed full of like, you know, um, the equivalent of like Newton's, what's what's Newton's big work called? Principal Mathematica. That's it. It wasn't like a whole bunch of that crack going on. Like a lot of it was just like literary and poetry, which is not mm. to say that, you know, literary arts and poetry is like not important. But it's not like we didn't discover where we didn't figure out how to make solar panels sooner because the library of alexandria burnt down you know uh so i that's something i actually i just i didn't know that like i i i thought the library of alexandria was like jam-packed with scientific information i didn't i didn't know that at all so fair play thank you uh artifexia and the other one of course was that like you know even if it was jam-packed with uh scientific information as you brought up on the last show um it doesn't necessarily mean that that would have came to fruition like if there was a plan in there for uh, a solar panel um you know that doesn't mean that then the culture would just be all like well now we're mass producing solar panels because you know they need to have an ep- economic driver mm-hmm. um so uh, and oh, an infrastructural one as well i mean i think yeah. that, that that's a huge thing that um you know if if you were to go back to give me a long ago time period or culture or something. Uh, give you one. Uh, the ni- yeah, it's just one. Uh, the 1980s. <laughs> give me a much longer ago one, please. <laughs> uh, let's go with uh, Anglo-Saxon Britain. Okay. If you go to go back to Anglo-Saxon Britain. Where um, where are we in Anglo-Saxon Britain? Pa- paint an image from Bill. Uh, somewhere in the... somewhere. Well, can we say the Dane law? I know that's like you're outside of strictly Anglo-Saxon. A lot. Um, yeah. We're somewhere in the Dane law in... The year 980. 980. Um, cool, cool, cool. We're in, are we in some sort of like tavern, are we? No, no, we, we're in a field. We're in a field, excellent. We're in a field, yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, and you know how to make uh, guns, right? Mm-hmm. Well, knowledge is totally useless. Yeah, yeah, for sure, because there's no infrastructure you know, there. Yeah, you know, how are you going to get saltpeter? How are you going to get like the, the metals of the relevant quality, etc.? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I had not an- anticipate how much of a driver that would be when I asked you said question. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that is... Although, 1980s. Yeah, 1980s. If you go back to the 1980s, right? But Bill, Bill, and Bill, you... Bill, stop, stop it. Where are we in the 1980s, Bill? Um, <laughs> where are we in the 1980s? Uh, Australia. Whereabouts in Australia? Brisbane. Brisbane. Okay, okay. Cool. Right. I'm picturing it. Got it. And you know everything there is to know about uh, app development. Mm. That knowledge is useless to you because there's no infrastructure to use it. Yeah, yeah, precisely. Um, so that was basically the first part. I- I'll link um, all of you Bean's comment 
mm-hmm. in the show notes if we want to read it. It's a long comment, so I won't read it out complete. Uh, the second part was basically like the idea of lost knowledge is somewhat erroneous in that like knowledge, uh, uh, you can interpret it as knowledge that never really is lost. It just kind of goes somewhere else. Um, and they um, they bring up the idea of like the dark ages and like how the common idea is that like, oh, Europe went through a dark period of dark ages, like all this knowledge was lost. Um, it, I guess that would be strictly true in a sense if you're only looking at like the, the areas of Europe that were in dark ages. But if you expand your horizons a little bit and you look at the rest of the world, it's like that knowledge um, didn't like get lost. Like they, you know, they kept progressing as such. Um, so, yeah, and that makes sense to me. I guess like it's, it's I, I would say it'd be incredibly difficult for yeah i think it'll be maybe i'm wrong with this but like i speculate that it'll be incredibly difficult for knowledge to just get completely lost from humanity um like if someone decided tomorrow that they we just want to we want humanity to completely forget how to make electric cars like that probably isn't doable unless like a meteor hits or something would you agree with that um like, it's incredibly difficult to completely erase ideas. Yeah. I mean, again, you have to, you, you would have to get rid of so much surrounding knowledge there. I mean, yeah, yeah. you might lose some of the, the specifics about, like, efficient ways to make it are high-capacity batteries or something. But, like, the fundamental thing of having a battery and making it turn a thing, you know, is a very... You, you you couldn't erase that idea very easily, and there's lots of different ways to approach the problem. I'm sure, and yeah, it would be it would be extremely hard. Yeah, um, um, and then the other thing, this isn't all of you being doesn't mention this, but just a thing that's popping in my head. Um, growing up, like I I really did think that progress was always linear mm-hmm. uh, and possibly exponential. I don't know. You'd have to go back to past Edgar and ask him exactly what he thought. Um, but it like it literally blew my mind. Uh, when I first learned about like peoples who would consider themselves to be the pinnacle of like human advancement and for that to kind of sort of be true in that like you know um, it's only like only of late has progress been kind of like very linear and exponential but like you go back through history you find like you know take Rome for example like you know you can be a Roman yeah, at the height of Rome and go like we are we are at the top of civilization in how we define civilization and then the thing falls and then literally literally you were at the top like tomorrow is not going to be more advanced or tomorrow may not be more advanced than what today is whereas in the modern world tomorrow is like broadly speaking obviously nearly always more advanced than what today is and that wasn't true throughout history and that fried my brain i remember dan carlin went into it an awful lot to try and get us the listener this is in a podcast called hardcore history to get us the listener to stop thinking like modern humans when it comes to like development that like there's ebbs and there's flows and like it's just we are um atypical the modern world is atypical in terms of like tomorrow is always more advanced than today um and that fried my brain when i first learned about it what, again, though, like, what is meant by... Because that, that slightly contradicts the thing about the, the loss of knowledge, doesn't it? Uh, no, but not, the, I suppose... No, no, it's not really about lo- uh, knowledge. This is more about, like, the volatility of culture or the volatility of uh, society. Um, now, again, I could be entirely wrong here and I just have a completely skewed view of history, but, like, the um, impression I get is that in back in the day... Back in the day um, like empires may have risen and fallen at a more frequent rate than they do so now, you know, or societies or settlements and civilizations um, would have risen and fallen at a, at a, at a greater rate. Because like, if you think about like, like how many, how many countries, how many nations have we seen pop into existence throughout the course of our lifetime? Like, Maybe mm. five or six. I was you like was, nation states, like nation states for argument's sake. Yeah. Uh. Well, the dissolution of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia is one. So there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a few there. Um. But yes. Yeah. There's a couple there. South Sudan is another. East East Timor, South Sudan. Um. Uh, but like, we, I I guess the 
the uh, Soviet Union broke up within our lifetimes, but we didn't really witness it. That's fair, yeah, yeah. So we like, won't count that one. So that's so that's. I mean, I guess that can seem like a lot, but um, I know that around or was it before the Greco-Persian Wars, there was just like there was just a whole ton of civilizations going on around the sort of um, is it the Levant area? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's just a bucket load of them. Like the Elamites were ones. Uh, there was there's tons of them, and they just like they all just like vanished all of a sudden. And it was the Elamites that took over Big Steiner, where they were one of the well, ones I mean, who... Um, what, what are we considering all of a sudden there? How do we know the specifics of when they when they ceased existing? It might seem like all of a sudden to us, but have happened over 200 years. Like, how long did the Bronze Age collapse take? Yeah. It took, it took decades. Uh, sure, sure. Okay. Uh, th- I mean, that that's fair enough. Um, I'm largely going on the hardcore history here and the impression I was painted for me on that show was that it was um surprisingly quickly um that it occurred um and yeah I guess that like uh, maybe Dan Karen's wrong about this but that kind of furthered his his narrative of like you know back in the day um you could just be at the top of the pinnacle of of civilization and then like tomorrow it could all just fall down and collapse um in a way that doesn't really seem to happen that often now but okay but you're saying it doesn't seem to ha- happen that often now you're only going to get a witness that once elaborate like the same civilization can't fall twice you know if it's fallen like where do you go from there yeah i mean yeah and if, like i'm sure it didn't seem likely to happen to uh your average hit height the day before the sea people's hit, you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah. I just, it just seems like there's a very kind of... Um, You're completely undermining everything that I thought was great. Thanks. Survivorship kind of bias there. Like, you know, it, it seems like the same fallacy as you're describing. I can't quite formulate it exactly. Um, I'd have to maybe think about it. And I'm, I'm a bit of a pessimist, so I think it's going to be, you know, the next one's going to be the worst one. Like it was never, it was never a thing of um, uh, total environmental collapse before. Yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure. Like you know, climate change and all that crack, like that sort of collapse that uh, will come. Uh, that is going to be, yeah, that's going to be a hell of a one. Um, trying to think, is there any way of? Uh, if I, uh, if we really need to do st- uh, stone sky here, but if I just may try one more time see where I'm coming yeah go for it um, this might be awful but if we take like the notion of you know Moore's Law right no uh, so Moore's Law oh crap I'm going to get it wrong I think this is where like uh, was it capacitors will um, oh yeah 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 it, computing power doubles every whatever yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Um, like the impression I get again primarily from listening to Dan Karen talk was that like you can you can kind of like that's a very specifically like a modern thing to to be even able to consider the fact that like oh this will just just keep going like we these things will just keep getting better and they will keep getting cheaper and we can just we can basically almost like compute that and like so far like moore's law has held i know that moore's law is coming to an end that's fine but uh um this is just held right and the impression i got again from listening to dan dan karen is like that's not even something that people back in the day would even entertain thinking about the idea that like this would just linearly linearly progress um that they by virtue of uh like the the world in which they stood in were like no like all around us there's like so much ebbing and flowing going on that like it is perfectly viable for us to go like oh no we're just we're at the top of like the, the tech tree here. The tech tree won't extend on beyond us. We cannot guarantee that the tech, tech tree will extend on beyond us here. Because again, we look around, there's like a ton of ebbing and flowing. Whereas again, in the modern world, uh, we we can, with like a fairly great degree of confidence, up until the climate apocalypse, I get that as well. Uh, we, we can kind of go like, yeah, things will be more advanced tomorrow. And that has like held true uh for like 
many many decades um you could argue like almost like you know maybe a hundred years plus um so does that does that does that does that make any sense kind of but like i just think it's it's a very it's a very hyper focused on a on quite a small thing and like who is it getting better for who is it getting more advanced for it, for you know maybe half the world yeah oh okay, yeah sure like that no that that i will completely accept yeah for sure um like and i i the these 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 ends aren't part they're never part of what what um we th- we think people think about as i said like the the hittites weren't expecting to see peoples or you know whatever um whatever the specifics of the bronze age collapse were um you know i i, I don't see how it's fundamentally any different i mean you could I, I don't see why you couldn't just as equally say well you know my empire has been running pretty smoothly for for two centuries now and you know we haven't been invaded by anyone from the steppes and you know there's been no there's been no famines and the, the the grain harvest and our slaves haven't revolted and you know why is why is the current era existentially different yeah maybe it could be that we have like bent uh nature and stuff to a degree to our will um because it, like on the oh god this is turning into a whole talk point so sorry folks uh, we will this move is on. this is world building relevant. I mean, I refuse to allow you to apologize for this. <laughs> but I mean, like, like so famines, right? Um, okay, now again, I could be very wrong, and you might tell me I'm wrong here. But let's just go with me for a second. Um, famines in the modern world are pretty much a man made phenomenon, um, as far as I understand it. Um, usually, if there's a famine, someone is to blame for said famine. It doesn't just occur as part of nature. Mm-hmm. Um, so, whereas perhaps, may I assert that back in the day, uh, these, like, more natural phenomena um, would have been more prevalent. Because, like, we didn't have the science to bend stuff to our will. We didn't have the science to, like, GMO stuff and greenhouses and all that sort of crack. Um, so, uh, like, a lot of maybe natural catastrophes might have been far more devastating and potentially, like, existential, a, a big, massive existential problem. Um such that it could paint a worldview for people of like, yeah, tomorrow, it could all just go wrong tomorrow in a way that modern people, by and large, just kind of go, tomorrow will be better, by and large. Uh, um, could that be a factor here as well? Mm. Or like like uh, the tsunami that hit Japan, like the tsunami that hit Japan a while ago and, and knocked out the nuclear reactor, like that was obviously like terrible and awful and stuff. But again, I imagine like take Japan and then like move it back like a thousand years or whatever and you have a similar high... Uh, um, a similarly devastating uh, tsunami hit, surely that would have more of an existential problem uh, for the society at that time than it would in modern times, because we have all of this science and, like, um, all this science to, like, um, bolster us from these things. I don't know if it would have been an existential thing for the society. I mean, it it, it, it would have caused a lot more deaths, but would it have been necessarily a threat to, to social order? I mean, I, I think it could do, couldn't it? Like, yeah, it would cause more debts. It could, like, you know, knock out, like, important cultural sites. You could, like, lose a whole bunch of, like, uh, your your library of Alexandria might, like, flow down the river sort of thing. Um, like, I, I, I guess things are more stable comparative to the... How, how to phrase this? It's more stable for the exact same threat. For, for for like dealing dealing with with an identical threat like a a famine or something, but also there are lo- equally bigger scale threats. The threats can have scaled up also. I mean that's fair, and that's where like climate apocalypse comes in. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I would say that the, 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 there's a multiplicity of of like stable elements there. Like there's lots and lots mm. of things that we have as a, as a sort of a species stabilized over time. Uh, and yeah, like you know we can't stabilize everything, and you know climate apocalypse will come and like wreak havoc for all of us. But like that is not something that we'd expect to occur every you know 
five ten years in the way that like a natural disaster or a famine or mm. a flood or whatever happens and um, so by virtue of the modern world being inherently more stable um than previous times uh I think you, one can assert that it leads to a worldview that us modern people kind of go, tomorrow will be better. Whereas back in the day, possibly no one, if or maybe just like the, the majority of people would not be like, tomorrow will be better. Um, yeah, th- did people have the same concepts of, of progress as well, though? I mean, that's that, that they expected for things to be different or for things to be better. We, we, we have that as like, we have kind of evolutionary thought and we have like, Quig historiography and everything that you know we, where we think in terms of things becoming better and progressing i don't know that would have been a, a concept even I, I think that's kind of what like carlin was getting at like the, the way people's conceptualized progress was just inherently different like we conceptualize progress as like the upward exponential trend and that's how we think of progress whereas back in the day if you're to get in the mindsets of of uh pre-modern people you have to ditch that notion and try and think a little bit more like them in a world that is more full of ebbs and flows and instability, etc. Um, I think that was the the, the, the the point of highlighting this. Right. You know? Anyway, Jesus Christ, right? How do we start? Why do we start this? All of you be... Damn you, all of you be... <laughs> I really enjoyed this... Um this uh, graph that all of you being linked in their comment. Yes, I'll throw it in the show notes for everyone. It's so daft. <laughs> so, for... Like, Go, go, go on. Okay, so for anyone who's who who is can't see it, um, it's a, a two dimensional uh, graph. Um, the horizontal axis goes from one thousand before current era to two thousand of the current era. It's divided into centuries, and the vertical axis is labeled scientific advancement, um, which, as we know, is a linear quantity, um. And so in the very first part here, from kind of 11,000 BCE to oh, like 700 BCE, uh, that's colored in blue and it's gradually curving up. Uh, sorry, it's colored in yellow and it says Egyptian. That's, you know, the Egyptians progressed a bit. And then the color turns to blue and it curves up a little <laughs> bit faster. It's the Greeks. And that brings us to like 100 before current era. Mm-hmm. And then we get the Romans. They're coloured in green, and it begins to to go up much more quickly. Um, and that takes us up to five hundred CE, maybe two, two, three. Or sorry, four hundred, just a little bit after four hundred CE. Um, and then, right, there's a dashed line rising extremely quickly. You know, almost ascending to vertical. Yeah, it's uh, ex- asymptotically rising. Yeah, it's exponential. Yeah. But that's a dashed line to show what we could have achieved were it not for the whole left by the Christian Dark Ages. Now, the next period lasts for over a thousand years. There's a rapid decline and it's colored in black. (laughs) And that stays flat, barely above the level that the Greeks began at. Um, And that takes us up to like 1400 uh, current era. Then we turn to grey for the Renaissance. 300 years of rising pretty quickly. The Age of Enlightenment, 100 years, and then we get to modern science. And it shoots up very, very quickly again. Um, and I just I just love this idea that nothing progressed in any way between 400 and 1500. Yeah, and then like, uh, to, to all of you beans' comments, like, that's only... Uh, if, if, if we accept this as being true, which we can't, but let's just accept it as being true, that's not looking at, like what was going on in like China or, oh, yeah. you know, so like it, it, it treats the whole world as Europe yeah, uh, yeah, or a specific portion of Europe, which is obviously daft. Um, but like the, the idea that things were identical between 500 and 1500, like c- castles. <laughs> well, if you look at architecture, like it's totally different. <laughs> they, they were like, if you if you look at like what people lived in 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 even like kings in as mentioned earlier Anglo-Saxon Britain versus the castles of the 1400s they're vastly different the technology was totally different yeah did this nothing graph, like I, I would encourage people to look at this graph it, it is it is insane um and just at the you know just before anyone says like Breaker, are are you not kind of advocating for said graph 
uh, in your whole like back in the day you could have been the pinnacle of civilization and everything drops off as in like back in the day you could have been the green patch there the romans and then tomorrow it all just falls off a cliff i i, I think um I, I don't prescribe to this idea at all i think it's more of a local thing like there's obviously undulations locally the whole time things ebb things flow uh oops sorry um do you know you might uh, a, a culture might undergo a period of intense conservatism and then extreme you know growth and things like that uh it's much more local yeah. and it, it has no bearing on kind of like the overall trajectory if you know what i mean um so like uh, yeah i don't prescribe to a worldview that like had the dark ages not happened in europe uh we would have like uh holograms or whatever um that's 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 not what i'm, I'm prescribing to <laughs> Because I, I can imagine, I can imagine someone. Being, I love you're like looking for a thing and you just on a hologram. Yeah, I was looking. I was looking for tech that we don't have, but, but like could could have holograms. Like holograms, like the Doctor from Voyager holograms. Yeah, yeah, not like like the crappy holograms we kind of sort of have now. Not 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 Tupac at Coachella. <laughs> no, not Tupac at Coachella. No, I mean I mean more advanced than that. Um... But but yeah, anyhow, anyhow, so yeah, I do not prescribe this idea, even though I think what I just said would, makes it sound like I do. Does, does, does that make sense to you, Bill? Like, the difference here? Kinda. <laughs> I don't agree, I think, but I kinda see what you're saying. I am now more confused than I was at the start of this conversation. Christ, time for me to go away and re-exa- re-examine <laughs> my beliefs. Okay, time to move on. Jesus, we're over an hour in. <sighs> Shall we do some Stone Sky? <laughs> We should do some Stone Sky. So, slight change of format this month, folks. And going forward, if everyone agrees, uh, we are not going to do any world building. Oh, uh, reason being that in in episodes where we review a book, uh, we're going to no, we're not going not going to do any world building ever. Sure. I should make that clear. Please do, yes. <laughs> yes, that makes sense. But in episodes where we review a book, we're not going to do world building. Uh, so we can spend more time talking about the book and also we can give Bill a, a little bit of time off um, from writing. Because, like, you always hit those those writing deadlines. You've never... I don't think you've ever once missed. Um, and sometimes I know that... I don't think I have. No, and I know sometimes you're kind of like... Like the like the night beforehand, you're like, oh god, what do I write? Oh my god! Uh, so just to give you a little bit of a break and to give us more time to talk about the book, I think it's probably wise. Sure, yeah, oh. we'll we'll see what the, we'll see what the 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 fans think, but sure. um, if that works for people, sure, exactly. Um, now, so that means that means from this point forward, we are going to be discussing Stone Sky, the third book of the Broken Earth trilogy by N. K. Jemison. Links in the show notes to this. Um. If you've not read this book uh, and you don't want to hear any spoilers, stop now. There will be no more content after this section. This is the show done for you. Warning, warning, warning. Don't continue. Um, also, Here be spoilers. Here be spoilers. Um, and also, just it's worth, it's worth mentioning again that this book is kind of horrific, uh, much like the rest of this work. So just trigger warning for like abuse, uh, all sorts of bad things right genocide genocide there's like slavery subjugation of people like all the bad things just there's a trigger warning for them right um just i I suspect we are going to talk about these things um so watch out for that um so with all that done stone sky nk jemison bill uh do you want to give us a brief summary Okay, well, I messed up the summary the last time when we did um, Obelisk Gate. So, okay, let me let me try this again. Did you? Well, I, I gave a really long answer and you said, yes, but that doesn't tell us anything about the story. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, or something to that effect. Yeah. So, let me try this. Um, at the end of Obelisk Gate. The second uh, book. In the the second country. book. Um, Asun, the main character. Um, had saved the the calm she was living in Kastrimia from um, an external army, and um, but ruined the calm in the process. Um, her friend um, Alabaster had finally turned entirely to stone, and had seemingly been uh, sort of reincarnated as a as a stone eater. Uh, although it's not carnation, rein 
Gia Nation. <laughs> sure. Because he's rock. Uh, as a stone eater. Um, and they were going to have to leave the Kestrimia, the, the, the calm they were in, to, to find somewhere else to live. Um, that was in her plot. Um, and her daughter had uh, killed Gija, uh, Esun's husband, Nasun, the daughter's father, um, for trying to trying to kill her when, when it was clear she wasn't trying to stop uh, being a, an origin. So that's where we pick up. Um, over the course of this book, um, Esun uh, travels with the remaining people from Kastremia, uh to the city of Renanus, which they know is abandoned. Um, and Nasun travels with Shafa, her guardian, formerly Essen's guardian. Um, and they both have the, the goal to use what is left of the, of the obelisk gate of the, the network. Um, in Essen's case, to catch the moon and return the moon to its orbit around Earth. And in Nasun's case, to bring the moon uh, into collision with Earth to uh, kill everyone and end pain into the pain and suffering of the world. Um, interspersed with this, with these two stories, is what is gradually revealed to be Hoa's, the Stone Eater's backstory, mm. um, and how the seasons began. Um, we learn that they are uh, artificially created humans uh, from the, the civilization before the first great season um, that were, were created to control the obelisks also created by the civilization um, and uh, provides uh, unlimited magic and power in the course of this they, they realize the the kind of hypocrisy of the of the civilization they live in and it, it becomes clear to them that they are being abused and exploited as artificially created members of a, a genocided ethnic minority um, and in deciding to rebel, they cause the um, the Earth to lose the moon, um, and it's we come to realize that the Earth is in fact a sentient entity, um, and they instigate the the seasons because the the seasons are the Earth attempting to take revenge on humanity. Well, that's that's been kind of clear already, but it becomes it's it's a it's a conscious uh, decision on on behalf of a. a uh, an entity with agency. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end, um, Esun and Nasun are both in Core Point, which is the kind of the the last remaining part of the or the last remaining settlement of the civilization from beforehand. It's abandoned now, except for the Stone Eaters, um, to take control of the the Obelisk Network and do whatever they choose to do to the Moon. Um, Esun tries to stop Nasun from doing so. Uh, from, from making the, the moon collide with the earth and killing everyone. Um, in the final moments though, because she's, she's never been able to control her daughter that way. She's never been able to order her around. And in the final moments, she decides to, to give up. Um, because she loves her daughter and, and wants to atone for the horrible parent that she's been. And this act of, of, uh, love. Uh, convinces Nasun to not kill everyone and instead put the moon back in orbit and this uh, settles things between humanity and the earth. Hmm. And then Nasun uh, becomes a stone eater. Uh, Esun becomes a stone eater. Oh, Esun, sorry. The name. Esun becomes a stone eater. But Nasun, yes, has, by um, activating the, the network, um, has destroyed her orogeny and if she uses it anymore, she will gradually turn to stone, as uh, Esun and Alabaster did beforehand. That was a that was a that was a summary right there. Wow. I feel it was a little too long. <laughs> it was a bit. <laughs> you're not one for like the. You're not one for the. You know, dude goes to desert planet, becomes shaman CPU, and then becomes king. You're not one for the one line summaries. I did. I that's, I did it pretty well on Dune. No, you did. Yeah, you did. Uh, I guess if I were to, so so that is what everything you've said is like accurate, you know, and it contains a lot of detail. I guess if I were to give a slightly more broad view of what happens in the book, is that the whole point of the book is basically for uh, our two main characters, Esun and Nasun, mother and daughter, to meet in this one location called Core Point 
to wield the obelisk gates a uh, gate uh to their ends and the mm-hmm. book is about you know figuring out like what end that will be and then as you say bill interspersed throughout this book we have a flashback sequence where we learn about the the uh, almost like the deep history of this world and how how it became to be as it is um mm-hmm. that's kind of a, a more broad level but bill but it's good that you gave me all the details because uh, my first comment on this book is that i think this is a book that should not be consumed in audiobook form okay and i think this whole trilogy is one that should not be consumed in in audiobook form because uh it's maybe i'm just really stupid but it's hard to follow Mm. Um, what's going on and if you're listening to it whilst doing the dishes or whatever your mind will sometimes wander and you're like oh that's a really big stain on that pot and then you lose like two minutes of like conscious listening and uh, that happened to me all the time and I was like what? what's going on where are we who are these people what's happening so I'm actually really glad you gave a detailed summary because that kind of puts my ducks in a row so thank you <laughs> <laughs> so I think this should be read as opposed to uh, to listen to and I also think that this is probably a series that needs a reread um, to like truly get what's going yeah. on I think yeah. the f- I think the first the first time through the series you you just at least for me anyways you're kind of struggling to keep those ducks in a row and then once you go back again, I think you will be able to like better appreciate the underlying themes and the artistry of what's going on, um, just because of of the way it's written, which is great. Like it's the way it's written is really cool, and the shifting perspectives and the different persons and things like that. Like, that's really cool. Uh, it just makes it f- a little bit harder to consume. I think that was did you did you have similar thoughts at all in terms of ease of of understanding? The the shift of perspectives I, I didn't I didn't find tricky, but I found uh Hoa's the uh, like backstory chapters hard to follow. I, I I if I had time I would have gone back and just read those themselves mm-hmm. um to get a bit better. And it, some of it is explained as it goes on, uh but it's still I found it a little bit dense or a little little bit um a little bit opaque. Yeah, I agree. And I think Silanagist was the, the worst culprit. Silanagist, by the way, is the name of the uh, old like continent-spanning city yeah. um, where Hoa and his, his kin lived. And that's where the seasons mm-hmm. were first started from. Um, while we're talking Silanagist, even though this isn't chronological order or anything, um, that... Uh, I, I like that we got a window into how things were. And how things came to be. It's it's a little bit tough in a third book. When you're meant to be wrapping things up. To introduce a whole swath of new characters. Um, and uh, new new locales. And all this sort of crack. I found it extremely hard to keep up with the people. Uh, in Silanagist. Um Because there's already like. You know. There's, it's, it's not Game of Thrones level of characters. But like. There's already a lot of characters going on. And then you have just even more. And that was that was hard for me to to process. And the thing that made it really hard was that all of the bloody characters had the same suffix at the end of their name. So we have like Renwa and Gewa, and I'm sure there's a few other Wa's. Hoa. Like Hoa. And it's like, aside from Hoa, I couldn't differentiate these people. I have no idea who they were. And like every time she was like, and then Renwa stepped up and I was like, that could be one of the 10 people that are named something Wa. Um, I think Jemison's naming conventions are, they're just, I don't understand why they're just so almost purposefully opaque. Like like the Nasun, Esun, they sound so similar. Um, and it just means that when I'm listening to it, I'm like, wait, so like even throughout this third book, I was like, so wait, who is Esun? Who is Nasun? Oh yeah, yeah, Nasun was the child and Esun was the mother. And it's like, just make them distinct. Distinct, like that's not, one is Brian and one is Ted. Like it's just, it's it's not hard. I, f- I found that to be almost obtuse in its construction. Really? Uh, yeah, it just it just makes it harder to track, you know. Hmm. And uh, maybe again, maybe this is just me, but I, I find a similar thing in uh, the new season of The Last Kingdom has come out. Right. Uh, which is Anglo-Saxon Britain. It's like yeah. Game of Tr- Game of Thrones in Anglo-Saxon Britain, basically. Yeah. Um, uh, Bern- Bernard Cornwall series. Correct. Who did Sharp? Wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all the names there. And again, I, I, I appreciate that I think these are historically accurate, but it kind of doesn't make it any harder to comprehend. Is it like they're like Ethelfled, Ethelwald, Ethelweird? And I, oh yeah, they loved Ethel. The Anglo-Saxons loved that as a, as a prefix, didn't they? 
Yeah, and I mean, like, love a bit of Ethel. <laughs> they love the bit of Ethel. Like, I'm, I'm, and again, if that's historically accurate, so be it. But like, that's one of those places where I'd be like, maybe just bend it a little bit to just make it a little bit easier to understand. Uh, make the names a little bit more separate. Um, because I'm constantly, when watching that show, turning to the captain, being like, "So wait a minute, who is Ethel Weird?" And then it's like, "But I thought that's the, I thought that's Ethel Wald." And then it's like, "No, that's not Ethel Wald." That's- <laughs> and one of them became a pirate called Ethel Beard. <laughs> Ethel Beard, yeah. Um, and it's like, that's not Ethel Wald, that's Ethel Fled. And it's like, oh, it's just so hard. And so this book suffers that for me. You, you know, Nasun, Esun, and then Renwa, Gewa, Howa, and it all just like, it all merges into one big, the names that end in Un and the names that end in Wa. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't like that. I think the naming could have been better. Yeah, that doesn't bother me. Mm, it bothered me a lot. It just made comprehension that much that much uh, harder. Uh, I will say the the countdown part of Silan just was cool because uh, if I recall correctly, like the first uh, flashback Silan just chapter we get is I think five. Yeah, and then yeah. it goes four, and then it goes three, and then it goes two, and so very clearly it's like counting down to the event that mm. broke the world, that, and then it's one, and then it's one, and it's just like that's kind of fun. And then it's zero. Oh, thanks, Bill. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, like that was that's just kind of a little fun little thing in there. That's really fun. I like that. Yeah. Uh, have you ever read uh, "Use of Weapons" by Ian Banks? No. Okay, I can't. It's really hard to remember exactly how that's structured, but it's it does a really interesting thing. That, so the, there's two kind of alternating timelines in it. Um, the the first story is told how does it go oh, it's sorry it's, it's really it's really awkward to remember but there, there's basically there's one story where the chapters are in reverse chronological order and they are given roman numerals um and it goes it counts down hmm. and then the other they're given uh, just like latin or uh, sorry uh, arabic numerals and they count up, and at the end, the timelines come to the same place. So it's it's the same story being told in two directions and meeting in the middle. That's fun. I'm sure. It, was it hard to keep track of what's going on? No. Once once you once you figure out what's what's happening, it's 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 really clear. So like you're seeing you're seeing how this character progressed after something that happened and you know that there's something in 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 their past mm. and then you see that like you're also seeing them getting to where that thing happens and then at the end is you what the thing was mm. That's what fun. The, the traumatic event was um it's it's a it's a marvelous marvelous novel hmm. what's it called again use of weapons use of weapons links in the show notes folks that yeah. sounds really interesting um and i guess to a degree it's kind of akin to what's going on here um, a little bit. Um, yeah, in, in that there's kind of there's a countdown element, and that there's like different timelines and stuff. It's just yeah, yeah. The, the countdown is kind of what made me think of it. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Um, the whole thing about Silan just is like just like very sad. Like, yeah. The whole the whole like so basically, uh, as Bill pointed out, like these Hoa and his kin are like artificially constructed uh, beings. They they keep referring to themselves as being decanted. Um, yeah. and they are based upon uh, a a ethnicity of people that have been genocided, and they're just treated like you know unhumans. They're just treated like slaves yeah. uh, when they're no longer fit for purpose, or they get a bit too uh, uppity or whatever. They send them to a thing called the Briar Patch, uh, which is basically like I guess proto node maintainers in a way, isn't it? Yeah. So they're they're fed to the obelisks. Yeah. Uh, kind of. They're they're kept alive, but they're they're not really living as such. They're they're kind of in, in sort of a, a stasis and the, the obelisks are feeding off their their life energy. Yeah. And so the whole the whole thing is just like it's just horrific. It's just a big yeah. commentary on like uh, you know, the morals of oppressing people basically. Um yeah. and it's just it's very sad. There's it's- a there's a, a really nice touch in it that in each chapter, or probably a couple of times um, in each chapter set in, in that timeline, the you, you repeat, life is sacred. And that yeah. keeps coming back. And it just, the, the kind of the subtle insistence on it and the the ways it's placed or where it's placed 
it kind of gradually reveals to you that it's it's not it's hip, it's hypocrisy mm-hmm. and then there's a great line um when it's 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 clear how hypocritical they are it's it's made it's made um explicit with the line it is illegal to kill in Silana just because life is a valuable resource like there's nothing there's nothing moral in it it's 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 totally kind of this bleak utilitarianism that you, you know, it's it's a commodity yeah 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 for sure and as as you pointed out that like the earth being a literal character hmm. um his his or its life um is is again a resource that is there yeah. to be exploited and yeah. i think i think that's like there's so man, there's, like it, uh, there's so many themes going on here because you have the theme of like you know subjugation and like people being terrible to other people and then you also have like environmental exploitation teams going mm. on in like in depleting the earth and all those things and then there's like greed and avarice going on like there's so many bleak bleak commentaries about human nature yeah. going on at the same time that makes it really it, it makes it really great but really dense and very uh it's 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 a difficult read because it's just it's so yeah. sad and dark the whole thing oh it's awful um in a good way but uh on 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 the uh, i apologize we're jumping around lots here but on the father earth being a literal character so the earth is yeah. like is literally a sentient uh, like being or whatever. Um, have you any thoughts about that? I have thoughts about this element and its execution. What, what do you have any thoughts? Um, it was. I, I, if if I was to have a, a couple of criticisms of the novel, um, I think one of them would that be would be that it made certain things a little bit too explicit. I think it was it was sort of suggested very, very strongly before that the the earth was sentient and it was malevolent. Um Yeah. Like the earth the earth has father earth has lost his child. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, but to be fair though, Bill, like it, one could easily read that as just being that culture's creation, like mythos. Yeah, no, there's that there's that, but also the stuff about the the core stones that the guardians have and yeah. The you know when in the second book Tonki finds a core stone. Yes. Um, and just some of the stuff around that suggests to me that there's an intelligence. When I read it, it suggested to me that there was an intelligence at play. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in, in this book, a lot of those things that have been suggested are very kind of blankly stated. Um, and that was one of those things that you know when it's it's been suggested that there is an intelligence at play with father earth that it's not just metaphorical um and then some of the characters kind of meet him yeah they do and it was just, it was just a little kind of oh okay that's felt like that should have been <laughs> a, a, a bigger deal or or couched a bit more or something that is exactly the point i was going to make like uh, i think the, the like the air quotes reveal of the planet being a literal character um should have been given more gravitas because like again from my perspective and i may have missed it while doing chores and listening is that like the, you know nasum was like traveling through the earth and she like has an encounter with the earth and they exchange like a brief conversation i think kind of yeah and, and then that's that's kind of it that you know, th- there's not really much beyond that. And I don't remember that conversation being given a lot of weight or duration or anything. It was just almost like an offhand that sort of like, oh my God, the earth is speaking to me. And I think the earth says something like, does it say hello, little, en- little enemy? I think. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Um, and th- that's it. And then we get an insight into like Nasun's revelation. And then we kind of sort of move on a little bit. And it just, it didn't feel... Uh, very fulfilling didn't feel as monumental no no mm. and almost almost dare I say a little bit silly uh that it's just kind of like i get the impression of kind of like the traveling through the earth and the earth just kind of pops up and goes oh <laughs> and then just like leaves it's just a bit a bit kind of too fleeting for me to take it serious yeah um, what you mean. and also uh, as well in terms of like because that that i think is a uh, I guess it's a symptomatic of like further structural issues in this book. I think, um, I think in general, uh, Jemison spent far too long getting to the meat and potatoes of this. Um, like I was shocked when I looked down at my audiobook and the timer said like there's two hours left in this book, and I was like, 
but we still haven't like even begun to to like wrap this up and it's like we spent forever with with nasun in uh, renanus and uh uh, sorry, Esun in Renanus and uh, with Nasun and Shafa on the road. And then it all just kind of really quickly just wraps itself up at the end. Whereas I, I would have I would have enjoyed it more if the sort of like exploratory stuff was done in book two. And then book three was predominantly about like maybe being in core points. So then we can get more of a chance to like have interactions with Father Earth, etc., and things can feel a little bit more weighty and be given more time. But it's almost as if it felt like she ran out of time and was like, oh crap, I actually need to finish it. So like, uh, they mm. all just go to, they all just go to core point And then there's like a, what feels to me like not, in, not a very massive struggle at the end. And then it's kind of done. Yeah. And uh, th- th- structurally, I don't think that worked very well. I, I, w- I wouldn't say that about the, the series overall. I think like the, the things that, the, the events of one and two and three um happen in the right books but i would maybe have shifted around the the durations of certain parts of three yeah oh, yeah I, I can get aboard with that yeah for sure um it just it, it felt weird um the what else was i going to say other thing oh yeah um so this this book has some like odd similarities with star wars which is a bit weird because like star wars is kind of don't don't hate me for this internet but star wars is kind of like popcorn entertainment and i think this is a little bit more weighty than what star wars is or perhaps what star wars has become well, okay i, think I mean so. yeah, you know you know i'm not a huge star wars fan but yeah but like you know star wars is about us like you know cool force things and some laser sword fights uh, whereas this is about discussing... It's also about anti-fascism. It's also about anti-fascism, yeah. But, th- but this is about genocide and slavery and environmentalism. Like we, yeah, we, yeah. We, <laughs> the things fascists love. <laughs> yeah, well, that's fair. <laughs> but anyway, so I think there's some similarities here. And I want to see... Um, uh, do you think it perhaps maybe suffers uh, from some of these? Um, so, a common criticism of Star Wars I, I have read is that... Uh, Star Wars was very obsessed with people losing limbs. Uh, like, everyone would lose a hand. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and to the point where it's kind of like, oh, that's a bit, like, it's a bit trite. Uh, I remember does, reading... It doesn't one... happen in the sequel trilogy, does it? I don't think people lose limbs. I think we copped on. Because mm-hmm. um, it'd be a bit absurd if, like, you know, Ray lost a, lost a limb. And then they all just lose limbs left, right, and center. Uh, of course, but she's not She's not a Skywalker. She's a Palatine. Of so, course, so, yeah. yeah. So Which only Skywalkers an, lose their limbs. Which was an entirely planned and well thought out strategy. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, so, uh, and I remember reading a Reddit post uh, years ago at this stage where someone was like, okay, I have a rewrite for the sequel trilogy. And in it, they include, and then Ray loses her hand. And then a lot of the comments were kind of like, enough with the hand losing okay like stop it like we already did this sort of like you know tied it together once we don't need to keep doing this for end of all eternity i wonder do you think uh well one do you agree that that's kind of like kitsch and then further do you think this kind of happens in this book where it's like alabaster turns to stone and uh, esun turns to stone um or or Schroeder, let, let me rephrase alabaster's body slowly turns to stone because mm-hmm. of the consequences of his action uh, Nessun's body, pre-becoming a stone eater, slowly turns to stone because of the consequence of her a- actions. Nasun's body turns to, in part, stone because of a consequence of their action. Is it? A, does it suffer a little bit like, oh boy, here we go, main character number X, the body parts will go to stone? I didn't think so. Mm. For me, it, it was a bit kind of like... I didn't enjoy it. it got, I, I got Star Wars vibes from that bit. I just thought that was... It didn't, didn't work for me so well. Hmm. And I get you can use that to like, you know, metaphorically link characters together. Like, you know, Nasun's, or sorry, Esun's experiences mirror that of Alabaster's uh, as she progresses in her story. And then physically she mirrors Alabaster as well. Cool. Great. But if you do that every single time, it's like, oh, you stop it now. Um, so the, but that was one point. The other point was Star Wars. You've mentioned before in Star Wars that it suffers from uh, being too small scale. Like, yeah. uh, because it's it's all about the Skywalker family in this giant ass galaxy. Um, similar, do you think that this book perhaps suffers from being a little bit too overly concerned about 
this one family. Um, and it, it, the particular scene that made me think about this is where Nas, if we're, sorry, yeah, Nasu, the daughter, goes to Core Point and she's reading a book uh, and the book was written by Alabaster about her mother. Mm. And it, at that point, I was kind of like, this is just all a bit too incestuous here. Like, it's all like, you know, you know, like Nasun finds an artifact written by Alabaster who knew, who knew the thing and it all just ties in, you know, too neatly in a way to this one unit of people. Um, do you think I'm off base here? Uh, I, yeah, I wouldn't think that, no. I, like, what would make me have a similar thing to Star Wars is if she wrote a sequel trilogy that was about exclusively Nasun's family, Nasun's descendants, um, or like her gang being the people who changed the world again. That would bring me to that point. But within the, the thing of a single... Like, you know, it's my, my, my criticism of the, the original Star Wars trilogy is not it's, it's all about that Luke guy. No, but like when you're when you're expanding the universe over multiple mm. works and over a big period of time and those few people are involved in everything, it would be it would be an issue. And I don't think there's enough of a scale here for or enough works here for, for that to, to be relevant. Keeping it within, you know, the main characters who happen to be related by family. No, that, that makes total sense to me. Okay, I mean that's fair. Um, yeah, for for me it did trigger a little bit. Like it put, yeah, again, like just to restate, when she found that book written by Alabaster, I was like, oh, like maybe she could have. And I I get the reason because like it, it talks about uh, uh, her mother, and that's important leading up to uh, the fight or so with her mother, but. It was just like perhaps some a different book. Uh, perhaps she could have chatted to a different stone eater or something. Um, yeah, she didn't have the other stone eater. She had steel. She did have steel. I need to ask about the stone eaters because I think I missed something entirely about the stone eaters. Uh, okay. But we'll get to that in a second. Anyway, the point is I, 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 I thought it was a little bit kind of like too often the threads would just keep looping back on themselves to this one unit of people. Um, where I think I didn't think it was entirely necessary, but I take your point. Yeah, I guess the smallness uh, factor would arise out of when you seek to expand, but just fail to do so. <laughs> um, yeah, I do. I take your point there. Actually, yeah. Um, the stone eaters. Okay, mm-hmm. so I've I've almost definitely missed this. So I need you to clear this up for me. The Hoa is a stone eater, right? Yes. And so all people. All the people like Hoa in Sil- in Silanagist became Stone Eaters. No. They did not. What do you uh, mean all the people like Hoa? Like Renwa, Gewa. Oh, the, yeah. All the, all the tuners became the Stone tuners, Eaters, yeah. I think. Yeah. All the tuners. Um, they became Stone Eaters. So, uh, and they became not just like nondescript Stone Eaters. They became named Stone Eaters who were in the series, correct? Uh, as in, w- as in w- is Antimony and Steel and all of them, are they some of the characters from Silanagist. Specifically, those three are. Those three. Okay, so can you explain to me, because I had a hard time f- keeping up with the naming, who is Antimony and who is Steel? Uh, Antimony is uh, Gehwa and Steel is Rewa, I think. Rewa, okay. Uh, okay, okay, Grant. Yeah, see, now now I really want to go back and read the book again. <laughs> <laughs> to see can I piece together the characters there because I there was again I was do, out doing something and I, my my ear peaked to attention and I was kind of like wait a minute these these are the same characters uh, but I didn't cop that when it was first mentioned and so mm. for large chunks I was utterly confused about what's going on in the book um, okay another point on my part actually mm-hmm. no sorry sorry I've been talking loads have you got a point have you got anything in your notes that you wish to discuss Loads. Loads. Go for it, Bill. Um, okay. The overall framing of the novels now makes loads of sense. The way it's been partially narrated in yeah. in second person. Um, and it was clear from the second book that it was Hoa who was narrating it. I, 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 can I fight you on that a little bit? Okay. Uh, like, I, thought, I, I, I thought that from the second book that I, I, I realised that it was Hoa. So I mentioned the last time we were the, when we reviewed Oblis Gate book two mm. uh, that it wasn't made explicit that it was Hoa 
And in prep for this show, I went to the Wikipedia page. Now, obviously, Wikipedia pages can be flawed, but they say that it the reveal in this book, that it, it is made explicit that it's Hoa. I, I'm pretty convinced in the second book it wasn't explicit. Um, I didn't think it was, like, stated as such, but I thought it was oh, pretty obvious. Oh, so, oh, sorry, I thought you said it was stated. I'm sorry. No, no, um, I just, it, was, it was clear, but I yeah. didn't... Yeah. Yeah, same, yeah, I, I thought it was pretty clear as well, but this is where we finally... It, makes sense it's like yeah. it, it is in fact hoa uh yeah and and what it is is it's hoa telling esun her story after she 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 uh, recorporates as a as a stone eater mm-hmm. um so she can become who she is because there's, there's this stuff before that's made 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 clear that um your personality is kind of malleable and you you lose parts of yourself when you yeah. when you undergo that transformation but this is uh hoa trying to keep as soon who she was when, when yeah. she has this new form and i think even going back like to the f- to the first sentences of the first book where i i remember it opening up opening up at something like you are you um hold on i'm gonna I, it's I, it's with well it's not with an arms i'm gonna leap across my bed yeah, yeah. And get it. Do, do it do it do it that's the sound of bill leaping across his bed he leaps tall beds in a single bound there's some just background foley for anyone who wants to use it. Sure. <laughs> ASMR turning some pages. Uh, you are here is the is the title of the prologue. Hmm. Can you read out the first couple of sentences there? Prologue. You are here. Let's start with the end of the world, why don't we? Get it over with and move on to more interesting things. First, a personal ending. There is a thing she will think over and over in the days to come, as she imagines how her son died and tries to make sense of something so innately senseless. Oh. Yeah, so, sorry, I thought it was, I thought there was an opening that was something like, you know, Hoa reaffirming to, to, uh, to Esun that she is in fact Esun. It was something like, I thought it was something like, you are you. Oh, it's the start of the first chapter after oh. the prologue. Give us a read of that. Uh, chapter one, you at the end. You are she. That's she it. is you. You are Esun. Remember? The woman whose son is dead. There we go. There we go. Uh, I really want to reread this whole trilogy. <laughs> mm. um, also, a uh, small and s- slightly silly point about the, the overall shape of it. I will, it's silly. I will take Bill silly any day. It has kind of a, a, a classical uh, ternary form in like a kind of a classical sonata. Because the first book has three contrasting viewpoints, mm. the second book has two, and the third one has three, which you could get in like a kind of a, you know, an early classical or a baroque thing, like a triple meter, a duple meter, or a triple meter. Why is and, that? Why is that silly? Because it's not actually related to anything. It's not you know obviously there's no real connection to. Well, they're that, cross they're cross unrelated art forms yeah yeah sure but like but the, you know Jemison could have had that structural idea i guess no, i guess have, yeah, been like, yeah i want i want multiple i want uh yeah i want the middle to be sparse in terms of viewpoints and the outer to be more so yeah it's still it's still a question about form like i, okay. I get that she wasn't sitting down and being all like god it wouldn't be great if you applied like an early sonata form to a novel that'd be great <laughs> like obviously not but it's still an interesting structural point that i actually completely missed i didn't realize that we had only two viewpoints in oh we did yeah it was just Esun and nasun in book yeah, two. It's, it's just those two stories in the, yeah. in, the, in the second one there isn't a third one but there's a third one in the the opening and the closing uh yeah. volumes um uh some kind of analogues that I think might exist in this. Mm-hmm. Um, the institutionalization of the tuners, that's the, the created people, Hoa and such, um, seems connected... I mean, it's, it is explicitly connected to the, the node maintainers that we saw in, in the first uh, book. Mm-hmm. The the Aurigenes that are just kind of, you know, locked in, 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 a, in a building in pain to, to settle earthquakes. Um, but also, I think it's a little bit more broadly... I can't put my finger on exactly what, but it's something about the medicalization and the institutionalization of just ways of being that like people who are a certain way, mm. like, you know, wh- whether it be mental illness and neurodivergence or, or something mm. are institutionalized um, are treated as, as other. Um, and I know it's not a, 
a perfect analogy because they are uh, artificial humans. They are created. Um, but I think there's something. And and then the, the way in which you, you see Hoa's behavior in his point of view chapters, um, you know, that he, he, he is not a normal person. He hasn't been allowed to socialize normally. Mm-hmm. And he has flaws from that that he thinks he can't access. But he also he sees through uh, the facades that people have as part of it as well. Um, hmm. I know there's there's some yeah. kind of resonances there. Yeah, um, I agree. And there was a line about the the so the ethnicity they're based on um, are the Thnes people. Yeah. And there's actually this has only just occurred to me now. There, there's there's a lovely subtle thing that their their name is is given that way once Thnes like T H N E I S S, and then it said that. They they couldn't pronounce that, so it just became Nias. Yeah, Nias. Yeah, Nias is that how it's pronounced in the book? Mm. Um, even even though that meant something different, and then they're only referred to as Nias there on, and it's just like even even in this telling, which is kind of meant to be sympathetic to them, their their truth has been erased. Yeah, that kind of harkens back to the conversation we had in follow up there about uh, terms, cross linguistic terms yeah. in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the, obviously they're, they're, you know, about kind of subjugation and, and genocide and, uh, diasporas in general, but I think there's very clear analogs with Jewish people mm-hmm. yeah. because the, the descendants of the Nias became part of every land, every people blending in among the rest and adapting to local customs. They managed to keep hold of who they were though, continuing to speak their own language, even as they grew fluent in other tongues they maintain some of their old ways too. So it's like, you know, Jewish people have gone to everywhere in the world and they have become part of it, but are still have their own identity. I thought that was a very clear kind of, I assume deliberate um, analog. Uh, on the Nias, real quick, um, there's a bit in the book where I think they said something like, you know, the uh, the Anagist or whatever, like treated them as being uh, different. Mm-hmm. Um, I th- I can't remember were they treating them as kind of like uh, the mystic sav- savage sort of thing uh, as in like oh they're so uncivilized but brilliant or whatever or was it more uh, awful I can't remember but in any case and th- th- then Jemison went on to say that they like conducted like studies on them or whatever and found that they were no different uh, to the Silanagists. Yeah. and then but in order to perpetrate the lie that these people are like different they like bred Hoa and Hoa's kind to have all of the things that they, they to like to make all the things that they thought these people had that were made them different to actually make that manifest. So it's like, yes, look at them. They are in fact what we say they yeah. are, which is so grim. Because if you imagine- Reification of bigotry, yeah. Exactly. Because if you imagine like, this is, sorry, this is going to get really offensive for a second here uh, while I paint this imagery. Actually, wait, just, just to make it, perhaps a little bit more palatable. Let, let's say Irish people, right? People have, uh, like, notions about Irish people, like, you know, uh, drunks, uh, all redhead, uh, uh, that sort of crack, right? Um, and let's imagine, like, a, a, you know, people studied loads of Irish people and we're like, well, actually, they're not all sort of drunks, but we don't want to believe that. So what we're going to do is we're going to, like, breed people to have all of the characteristics and features of what we want to think of them because we want to think of them as being lesser so you end up with like this like horrible misshapen like race of people with like red hair coming out of like every part of their body and they're like you know biologically dependent upon alcohol or something like that (laughs) all in the core all in the all to serve the purpose of you needing to like hate those people you know it's just it's so brutally grim like yeah. it's so awful it's like oh yeah it's rough um oh uh, another another uh interesting thing was I, th- I think it was clear from one of the other books that uh stone lore had changed over time yeah. this is the 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 kind of uh traditions handed down to keep people safe during the upheaval of the seasons um, I think a yeah, tablet tablet tree was edited. I think, or yeah, and it, there there had been other tablets as well. As I think is mentioned in this one, I can't remember where they'd been mentioned before. Um, but again, that just kind of is institutional knowledge is always 
subject to uh, political influence and mm-hmm. to the needs of of a uh, hegemonic culture. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's a, a nice point to see acknowledged. Mm-hmm. Um, what else was there? What else have I got here? Um, the stuff in italics that I always enjoy, and I know you always enjoy. <laughs> um, there is repeated reference to uh, the project of a, a scholar who is finding examples of origins saving people yeah or, uh, averting disaster um and this actually ties into the previous thing about the institutional knowledge um the the i think the final one or one of the last ones we see uh, this these are just like chapter endings um Little, little extracts at the end of chapters. One of the final ones we see is their funding being denied and them being essentially sent into academic exile because what they have discovered is so unpalatable to mm. the to those in charge that they're they're they can no longer be supported by their their academic peers and they're being sent away for their own safety so that they don't get assassinated for mm. for doing politically inconvenient and politically undesirable academia. And, and mm. each of those little bits of italic, though, uh, that was, I think it was uh, Yater Innovator D-Bars. I think that sounds right. Yeah, that, that sounds that, right. That um, the, each of the stories that he tells about Origins doing good things and saving people, like at every point, it resulted in the Origin being murdered. Yeah. And it was just... Either, either dying to, to, to save, either dying in the process of doing it, or being murdered afterwards. Yeah, the, the being murdered afterwards, so that's the real heart-wrenching part, part, yeah. part. Because, like, you know, if they die, if they, you know, quell an earthquake and die doing so, then it, that, that's, like, heroic, right? Yeah. But when they, like, save an entire town or whatever, and that town just goes, you're a monster, despite of everything you've done for us, and then just murder them. That's so barbaric and inhumane. And it's just, it's awful. Like, those those italic parts were just, they were very hard to read. Mm. Uh, this whole feckin' thing was hard to read. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, can I jump in? Yeah, of course. Um, jumping all around the place here. Um, I found uh, uh, things to be analogous with your work here. Or at oh, least, good. Or at least how... I want you to proceed with your work. <laughs> um, so I've talked before when you've done world building uh, about like, um, you know, like uh, the, the black and white issue and you have good guys and bad guys. And, you know, uh, very clearly you're, I think you're on the side of the groundsfolk in Icairn. Uh Like you personally would be aligned with the groundsfolk in Icairn. Oh, yeah. I think that's completely incontrovertible. Um, so... But at the same time, like I, I would hate to see your your world building go down a route where the groundsfolk or the people who seek to usurp the Abeski are just, you know, wonderful and they create a utopian society mm-hmm. uh, because I think that's not what occurs. And I mentioned, I think it was on the last show where I was kind of like, you know, I want the people who have done this latest mutiny to end up being worse than the people they repeat, uh, they replaced, right? And this came up in this book with regards to node maintainers. So it's, again, we've established that node maintainers are kind of like, uh, aren't they children for a lot of times? I, th- I think they're, they're taken as children, certainly, yeah. Yeah, So and then they're just, uh, they're basically just like put in like, uh, you th- think of it like a horrific dentist's chair with lots of like bits of surgical instruments strapping down to this chair. And yeah. they're just, I think they're sedated uh, and they just are stripped of like any and they're, sort. Of, they're, they're kept in pain. They're, they're kept to keep them anxious. To keep them anxious, so they continuously just like automatically quell uh, shakes around there. Uh, and so they're just they're just they take humans and just use them as inanimate objects, basically. And it's it's horrific and awful. And it was discovered. It was outlined in book one, and it's just one of the worst things I've ever read. Um, but in this book, there's a line where. Uh, Esun, uh, when they go to Renanus and they begin to set up like this con where she was like, no one's talking about this, but in order for this, in order for us to survive, we're going to need to rely on node maintainers um, to keep us safe. And then when a node maintainer, the established node maintainers that are out there, when they die or whatever, a new one is going to have to be put in place. So that means they are going to have to subjugate another one uh, and you know keep them in pain sedate them strip them of their humanity in order to keep them going and i had this kind of uh, this sort of idea of like you know you may want to build a better world for yourselves and your intentions may be in a good place but like if you're using the tools of the oppressor to do so 
you will be the oppressed. Yeah. Uh, or you will be the ones who are oppressing. Um, and I was... It, it the master's was, tools will never dismantle the master's house. That is that is the quote I was looking for, but I couldn't find it. Yes, you're right. <laughs> uh, and so that's the sort of thing. And it made me think of your work where I'm kind of like, yeah, eventually when the, the groundsfolk or uh, when they rise up and they they defeat or or at least sideline the um, the Abeski companies or whatever, I want to see... Uh, an incredibly brutal groundsfolk ran endeavor because I think that's what would occur, mm. um, and I think that was very similar here. And I thought that was that was kind of cool, and also once again extremely horrific. <laughs> Just, I actually, yeah, I, I hadn't I hadn't uh, picked up on that part here, but I've I've got the quote: uh, "To survive in Renanus, Castrima will need the node maintainers. It will need to take care of them, and when those node maintainers die, Castrima will need to find some way to replace them." No one's talking about that last part yet. First things first. Although, I Although. think th- I think in the context of the story, Kastrima is in a good position to not repeat that horror because it's a it's a community founded on the idea that that Origanes uh, can be trusted to to not be monsters and they are given humanity. So I think there's there's options there and how Kastrima has been set up that you know they could just allow Origanes to be. And that will, or, you know, it could be a job that is given. Sure. But I think what I said is definitely a reading you can read into it. Oh, yeah. No, it's it's it's, it's definitely, it is it is definitely a possibility that that is, that is implicit there. Yeah. But it's not it's not a certainty. No, no, for sure. For sure. Um, and anyway, like I said, it made me think of your work and how I'd like to see it progress. Um, whether or not you choose to do so or not is totally up to you. Just know that there'll be <laughs> ramifications if you don't go down the road that I, I, I like. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so th- those are uh, my bullet points. Uh, you, have you got uh, final things on your list to go over, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. I have. I think I've got three points. Three points. Point um, one. There's there's a lovely moment. Um, oh, God. So so, so the the point. stone eaters uh, could think of themselves as human. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a, there's a lovely moment when Nasun is in core point. Um, and she, she's just like, she's exploring the city and she sees a stone eater feed a dolphin. Yes. And uh, that's just, it's just this like tiny kind of irrelevant vignette, but it's just, you know, the, the, the stone eaters, the humanity that they still have, um, hmm. yeah. which I, which I really enjoyed. Um, you know, it's this like this moment of kind of care for something else. Um, even though by implication, the, that, that, Stone Eater is of the faction that wants to kill everyone. Um, mm. But yeah, you know, I, I I really enjoyed that. Um, uh, uh, sorry, on Stone Eater's caring, mm-hmm. uh, I think uh, Hoa Hoa's relationship to Essen is uh, ni- like really lovely and also a little bit weird at the same time. I think like he he very clearly cares about her deeply. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think uh, did, did you read elements of love into it? I think that's a possibility. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I yeah. think I think I think there, that's that's by no means a, a wild interpretation. Yeah, uh, but at the same time, he's also like devoured her. <laughs> Do you know, like he's eaten her body. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's this really weird, like dynamic where it can be incredibly touching, uh, and also like. I know, like, I guess abusive, like, you know, causing, like, bodily harm in a way. Now, I get, obviously, like, the eating of stone body parts relieves the, the person off the pressure of that and stuff. Mm-hmm. But they're still kind of like, it's like, it, it looks cannibalistic in a way. The aesthetics are cannibalistic. Uh, but at the same time, it's kind of like, I love you. <laughs> mm. uh, which is really bad. And also the first, uh, near the beginning of the book, when Hoa eats her, I think it's her her arm. Her arm, yeah. Um, I don't know if you can pull up this quote real quick because you seem to be able to pull quotes up mad fast. Uh, but there is the description, like his physical description, um, as he eats uh, her arm, is really unsettling, and it's something to, uh, akin to like he opened his mouth wider than any mouth ought to open, and I just I just got images of like his like jaw disconnecting and like you know, like, kind of, um, like, alien style, like, opening mm. up really wide, and then, like, these teeth, like, come into existence that you wouldn't ordinarily see, and it just, it was, if that really made my skin crawl, but at the same time, 
it's 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 painted in a vibe of like caring and understanding and like comfort because in, in that scene Hoa says I I don't want to eat your arm where people can see let us do it away in private mm-hmm. um and it's this intimate thing but it's also like horrific body horror at the same time yeah madness absolute madness made my screen crawl uh just really great <laughs> um uh, sorry something else that just occurred to me there sure um. I liked that this is a story where uh at the at the end um Essun is pregnant mm. and that doesn't really change anything. It's not like yeah. that she it's not this like huge thing uh, which is so common in 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 stories that oh well you're 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 pregnant now and that is your job as a woman so that's that's your first thing that you have to do. And it's kind of it's presented as an option that you know I'm not going to go and do this I'm not going to do this I'm going to have this child and I'm going to live here in in I'm just going to wait out the apocalypse um, and no she it doesn't change she she yeah. still has to do this thing regardless of the fact that she that she is pregnant and um, that I mean her her pregnancy ends because she dies mm-hmm. and and it's not like you know it's it's not something that had to be be an influence. On, on her decision making. Yeah, um, for sure. You know, that's kind of refreshing to see. You don't get that a lot in stories. No, I agree. Um, uh, come here, we are over the two hour mark. Can I say, would I, can I request that we have final point from Bill? Um, Sorry. I'm going to make a small criticism and then a final point. Oh, sure. Uh, so I said if, if I had one, I said one slight criticism before, if I would have another, um, the climax, where which is uh, Nessun and, and Nassun uh, resting for control over over the the obelisks, correct? Uh, to to do whichever to the moon, um, by necessity it tells rather than shows what is happening. You know that kind of bit of yeah. writing advice, um, and it's it's kind of it doesn't make for a great read exactly no. because it's just very dryly and then this happened and then she did this and then that happened and giving you a lot of kind of exposition and clarification as the action um yeah but all and also just for my point from earlier it all happens i think way too quickly um it's like stuffed away at the end of the book and it's over in a flash yeah Uh, and i don't think it's given enough weight uh in the context of the book but continue i i I don't mind uh sort of a rapid thing on but like if if you hadn't needed to do all of the exposition and 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 explanation of it as well, um, it it would have it would have landed a lot better. It would have worked a lot better for me. Um, that that would kind of be my other clarification is or my my other criticism that because of these things which kind of aren't visible and are kind of very idiosyncratic to the setting, to explain what's happening with the magic, you need to explain it really deeply, and it's hard to to kind of transmit the drama. Mm. While doing that, mm. um, okay. So that was that was my thing. My final point. Um, it's kind of ultimately about the violence that desperate people will do, um, and it's kind of yeah. a defense of it. Like the things that 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 they do are sort of justified. Yeah. Um, um. which I enjoyed, like. There's a, a a thing from a quote from Alabaster I have uh, highlighted here if I can find it, um, and, but it's essentially that you know, the, the, there will there will be pain and suffering, but everyone is going to suffer. You know, the, and the people who are who are already suffering aren't going to suffer any worse. Um, yeah, which I I think is kind of a a, a totally reasonable perspective, but again, not one you get very often. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, I'll get the I'll get the exact quote here. Just give me a second. What follows won't be good, but it'll be bad for everyone: rich and poor, equatorials and comless, sans eds and arctics. Now they'll all know. Every season is the season for us. The apocalypse that never ends. They could have chosen a different kind of equality. We could have all been safe and comfortable together, surviving together. But they didn't want that. Now nobody gets to be safe. Maybe that's what it will take for them to finally realize things have to change. Um, yeah, and hmm. just like, you know, they, they have safety, but the cost of the safety is other people's suffering, and that's not enough. That's not good enough. 
Um, no. And, you know, maybe if everyone has to suffer, is that actually all that worse? Yeah, I liked it. I liked that as kind of a message to take from it. Yeah, and it, uh, yeah, it definitely feels like a non-standard sort of message. Yeah. A bad status quo is worth disrupting. Correct, correct. Um, okay, so uh, in summation, for me, this trilogy is just ace. Um, mm. I think I think the second and third book are not up to the same quality as the first book. I stick by what I said that I think the first book is one of the best things I've ever read. I think uh, in, in the fantasy genre, I think it's absolutely bomb like i love it uh and yeah second third book are great but not so that they don't reach the same heights as the first one overall though amazing trilogy and whoever that that email uh whoever the person was that emailed us to tell us to to read this thank you Mm -hmm. thank you so much all right summation uh, thoughts on the book and the trilogy uh yay nay thumbs up or thumbs down thumbs up several thumbs up several thumbs Good, good, good. Um, so next time we talk, we're gonna we're go- next time we do book review, we're going to do something a little bit different. Artifacts here. Um, Bill and I would like to read a book called "Cooking in Ancient Civilizations" by Katty K. Kaufman. I'll leave a link in the show notes. Um, I have this vague notion that I think we should do more book reviews that kind of are like world building research in a way. Um, and I think this would fall under it, like, you know, everyday life kind of things, like how a culture cooks and then like food is great symbolism in culture as well. Uh, so this might be a fun little like world building research episode in a way. Uh, so that will be the next book. Next time we do book review, um, cooking in ancient civilizations by Katty K. Kaufman, pick up a copy, uh, for the review. Um, that's us. Super. Um, thank you for listening folks thank you uh, so much for uh, supporting the show on Patreon for picking up merch if you chose to do so for being active in the subreddit for emailing us links to all of this is in the show notes we will see you all shout out very- to chat shout out to chat hi chat hi Bob um, we'll see you all very very soon and until next time Edgar, Edgar out, out.